I'm delighted to say Sarah Donovan has joined us in studio to talk to us about uh, where we are with regards to the, the hurling season. Um, we should start with Limerick, I suspect, uh, in the in the news at the moment, uh, front and back pages, but we'll skip to the back pages. Um, but Michael Burney was on last night saying that he hasn't known a team in sport to react to adversity like this Limerick side. Maybe the Irish rugby team, but uh, anyway, they're pretty good at like absorbing what it is. It feels almost like it's kind of by design that they're happy to watch what you're doing and um, a bit like the Terminator. How did that work? What are you doing over there? Okay. No, we'll crush that now. We'll wait a while. Crush that then. <laughs> I'd agree. Um, I watched the highlights again of the, the second or the first half this morning. And there's a point where temporary clearance is to Jason Ford and he drifts off his man and he steps out and he a great little touch into the hand and he puts it over the bar. That's obviously not the intensity limerick we're looking at. So the kind of stats that they're talking about to change the game is simply push up on Jason Ford don't, don't allow him to win that easy score early on Limerick did a bit of that in the first half they did a lot of watching and then in the second half they turned the screw Is that is that because they're so confident or is that entirely what a game plan is like that um, I, I, why does this happen? Why is their second half so far so vastly superior to their first half? I would struggle to answer that question right now um, I don't understand, I suppose. I, I think they probably waited to see what Tipperary brought and what Tipperary brought was enough for 40 minutes. Mm. And then they just decided to to add a layer, right? And Now, I'm going to say this. Uh, the likes of Keane Lynch is benefiting from the work that the likes of Colin Coughlin is doing, right? Because two different scores came from Colin Coughlin breaking lines, doing really, really heavy mm. work. One from Gillan to put, tip ahead, or to put Limerick ahead, 1918. And another one where Keane Lynch gives him a ball, Colin Coughlin breaks the line and gets him the space to put to pocket, you know, put the ball over the bar. So they're kind of benefiting in the second half from real workhorses putting the players who are the quality players or the shooters into the best mm. positions. When you pick out the Keane Lynch's of the, of the Limerick team, is Kilkenny's attitude okay, man mark Ian Lynch, keep the ball out of his hand, or is it is that a dangerous manoeuvre against Limerick because they have so many good players across the pitch? Focusing on a, on a few of them specifically could lead could lead to problems elsewhere. No, well look, when Limerick were getting their scores the last day, Tom Marcy got a couple of scores, Kyle O'Neill got a great score early mm. on. You're talking inches. Yeah. Like Tipperary were getting within an inch of getting a hook on. And I suppose if Keane Lynch, that early ball for the there was a free from Dermot Burns to Keane Lynch, mm. that Keane Lynch wins that ball in hand and then he gets away and gets his score. Tipperary were going full tilt right up against him to try and stop him from winning the ball. They were just unlucky. So I think you have to step up on Keane Lynch yeah. and make sure he doesn't win that ball and target him first because what he does with the ball and the decisions that he makes and R- Rena Buckley spoke last week to Brian O'Driscoll about being a really good decision maker and that's what kept her in the team for so long mm. that's what Keane Lynch does he's a brilliant decision maker and he opens up pockets of space so he is the first man that Kilkenny have to target to shut down so that he doesn't make the right decision and open up a pocket of space before we focus a bit more on, on the, the finalists, um, from Tipperary's perspective, like I don't think they thought they were much closer to Limerick than the weekend has shown. How do you... Because it... Not, like... Were, they just handled us. Like it was... And also, it's still not really Limerick. Like the, the subs, the bench, the players they have to call on. If If we were to say... Face them, face them again in, in a Munster final obviously Tipperary would have come through some storms to get there and they'd be feeling yeah. a bit better about themselves I'd be really excited if I was Tipperary right. the likes of Garrett O'Connor right first half catch the massive ball out of the sky under massive pressure um, get some great scores so he knows that he has 40 minutes against Limerick and that's enough to keep them ahead in a game a high pressure game he goes into training for the next 6-8 weeks mm. and he says I'm going to go full tilt for the next six to eight weeks to see can I get yep. 60 minutes you, like if you know you 40 minutes and you've banked 40 minutes six or eight weeks will get you that extra 20-25 minutes so there's enough for them to build on I'd be very positive if, I, if right, I was okay. Tipperary coming out of that game hugely positive even, even though when Limerick put the afterburners on you never felt any doubt about the outcome not an issue for me when the summer 
the change of the, the ground, the possible injuries that could come into play. There's so many things that come into play in the middle of championship. If you look at the way Waterford fell apart last year and their their league form suggested that they were going to be incredibly strong. For Tipperary's point of view, if you can go 40 minutes with Limerick and you've eight weeks to find another 30 minutes, yeah. why not? I'd be very, very excited. I almost feel that in championship, one of the only ways that Limerick, I can see, foresee Limerick losing a big game is if they have 13 or 14 players in the pitch. Like, is that discipline, we saw it with Willow O'Donoghue striking back with a hurley at the weekend. Like, is that a possible concern or area of concern for John Kiley? There's been pockets of indiscipline all through the league from Limerick and it, players are allowed to react. That's no question. Mm. But they're overreacting. You know, uh, that's the thing that yeah. needs to be cut down. You're allowed to react. I'm allowed to give you a nudge. If like we're, They can't be saints. If you're going to get tug, of course you're going to react. But don't react with such aggression that the man is nearly dead in the ground. That's the <laughs> issue yeah. here. So don't that's make, what John Kiley has to deal with. Don't give the referee a decision to make. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, they've, they've always had a bit of that in them though, right? Like, so this is the the perpetual argument between that bit where you play on the edge and then you go too far. If it blows up over the course of the Munster Championship and they arrive in the All-Ireland Series with a couple of major suspensions hanging over them, that'd be a disaster. But it doesn't feel like... It always feels like there's a reason for it, that they're not they're not at full tilt and they're a little bit narky about the fact that they're not fully fit and that they've been caught by what they would see as an inferior team or an inferior opponent who is somehow managing to drag them into a, a 50-50 battle when they know that actually in their heart of hearts that it should be a 75-25 because they're the kings and they're the big dogs. And what was interesting on Saturday night was John Kiley's decision. If you remember Barry Murphy gets injured, uh, he's mm. a collision with his own player. He goes off. Garrett Hagerty comes on. Now, Garrett Hagerty last year suffered from the, the overreaction, we'll say. And if I was any manager at that point, other than John Kiley, I'd have said, leave Garrett Hagerty on now. Barry Murphy's done enough. John Kiley calls Garrett Hagerty back in, puts Barry Murphy back onto the field. Mm. And Garrett Hagerty's coming off, scratching his head, going, actually, I wasn't ready to come off here. So those bigger players, I suppose, are realising... Barry Murphy came back on, won a free immediately in his defence, and then obviously they they went, you know, they got a score out of it. John Kiley now has the opportunity to show these bigger players. Listen, I'm I'm building this team, kind of parallel to to your brilliance. Yeah, I'm building other players who were able to do the same job. Yeah, and like they are all thinking about a five in a row and matching the dubs. Like, of course they are. But and if if there's a slight hint that you're going to be the one who is the sacrificial lamb along the way, even though you're the most storied of the players. And like they're looking around and going, some players who are pretty good are no longer in the change room. That must create an environment where it gets uh, cutthroat in the best possible way for keeping your place, which obviously continues to drive the standards. They're in that sweet spot that the dubs had for a period of time. Absolutely. And look, we're looking at the under-20s are playing tonight, right? Uh, Limerick are out against Clare. Adam English is playing midfield. Shane O'Brien's playing corner mm-hmm. forward. They shoot the lights out tonight. And all of a sudden, they're going into training Thursday night, cock of the walk. And these older guys are going, God, you know, it's mm-hmm. just that freshness. Carl O'Neill's point in the first half yeah. against Tip was exceptional. I, I think this Tip team, and, and I'm delighted to say that you can watch them from every angle. They are just stunning to watch. Declan Hannan makes a decision in the second half on Saturday night. The camera pans away and we get to see him make a choice between an underhand pass and an overhand pass because the overhand pass is slicker and he does that in the space of half a second. And there's so much about Limerick that you just want to write down. There's 20, 20 different things in the second half that I loved that I hadn't seen before. Mm. And just their accuracy from distance as well. Yeah, now... The decision making in the first half was off because obviously Dermot Burns took a couple of shots that were wayward, that went wide. I think it was 12 out of 24, Michael Fernie was saying last night. You know, Aaron Galan's inside going, what, what, what kind of a ball was that? Yeah. You know, there's a frustration there. Use O'Dalig, use Galan, use Pete, Peter Casey. Don't be taking your shot from 80 yards. There's that bit of, I suppose, inconsistency that they need to iron out. Is that a league thing where you're allowed to do that in the league and you're finding your range so that come summertime uh, that that gets to 70-75% accuracy and suddenly they're scoring 30 points? Well, look, you make a mistake and then I'd hammer you Tuesday night in the dressing room about yeah. it. I'd show the video and I'd say, where was the ball? Where was the ocean of space? Yeah. It wasn't where you put it. Of those two defeated teams of the weekend, Tip and Cork, who are you feeling more optimistic about when it comes to 
Championship. I know I'm asking a Cork woman this question, but I hope to not talk about Cork this week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, if I'm being incredibly honest, I think that the maturity in the tip side is much more evident than it is in the Cork side. Cork, look, Ethan Toomey was playing midfield for Cork the last day. It, you know, he, the, Connor Fogarty and Alan Murphy did very well for Kilkenny in that midfield. I thought the Cork team looked quite young. They looked quite like Dublin you know, in the league, they had that, I suppose, freshness about them that isn't necessarily a good thing. The maturity is in Tip. Mm. And I think Tip will be much more confident coming into the Munster Championship than Cork will. Powell 74 makes the point. Limerick had no bookings in the Munster final, or in semi-final or final last year when the pressure was at its most. They were disciplined. I, I think that was kind of... Uh, John Keenan didn't see a, a game for the rest of the season after the Munster final because it was so frenetic and wild. So... That, yeah, you can't read too much into that. You can't read too much into the bookings. I do remember talking to Grod Hegarty about the sendings off though and like there was a sense that um, there's a there, they don't feel fully right but when they do feel fully right they're much more controlled because I think I think they're so surgical that they'll they will take whatever you have to give them and they'll be like okay grand that, that all you got yeah but uh, but I think that first half there was a, a number of points where they just stepped off tip and that's unlike them and I don't know whether that was them giving tip a window to to show what they have and then utilising it but I don't think teams are built like that to allow teams to kind of take a run on us it's not like you give a team a handicap and they say yeah. you know go go four or six points ahead and we'll see can we catch you yeah. I yeah. don't think that's what they're about mm. uh, Okay what about Kilkenny because um, like they still definitely have a peppering in of really top quality players to come back into that setup. and again I, I like the Tipperary game early in the league you're like oh this could be interesting but then it wasn't it was like mechanical in the best possible way we are still Kilkenny there's been it looks like there's been a continuation of the Cody era values and application and everything that you would have expected there's been no drop in that and uh, and maybe they're even better I was negative about them against Tipperary I just didn't like what they were trying to do that day they looked a more qualified team to play the short passing game against Cork so they've certainly worked on that in the last six weeks TJ Reid you know, finished up the end of January with Ballyhale in flying form. He's now had seven weeks off. Mm. It feels like an age since he's been out of the team, yeah. but it's only been seven weeks since we have seen him play. So you're expecting him to come back into the setup. He will be needed. Um, I think he will cause Declan Hannan more hassle than Noel McGrath caused Declan Hannan, you know, on, on Saturday night. Adrian Mullen back in the setup. Kilkenny had a spread of scores the last day, but Cork's indiscipline allowed Billy Drennan to get one thirteen. I mean, is he taking the freeze when TJ comes back? Has to. Didn't miss one. Has to, because TJ is so good. TJ at... takes them. You say, you're saying? No, I think Billy Drennan. Ha- I think Billy has to stay on them. TJ's game can be played in any one of the six forward positions. Mm. I think for the league, for what Billy Drennan has scored in the league, one fifty two. Yeah. You can't take him off these frees in, in a crunch period especially with the fact that TJ is older he carries injuries in championship if he gets a hamstring injury and Billy has to go back on the freeze, is it not good that Billy has banked that league final mm. has had that pressure scored you know put them through and yeah it's interesting right because obviously TJ has been doing it for so long it feels like some some games where he'll he'll win his own freeze and he'll score from freeze and it's like oh he didn't score from play like, he won like four of those frees <laughs> and he scored himself like yeah. you know the, the stats don't always tell the full no. story so he'll probably want to go back on them as like uh, I'm getting my eye in here I don't I don't think that would be an issue for, for TJ I, I just think for the league final if there's a, a throw up between the two it has to be Drennan it has to be Drennan. It's quite encouraging how Derek Ling has actually changed things. Like Hugh Lawler's gone from three to six, Podrick Walsh from 11, 11 to cornerback, yeah. which is like, he, he's he's entrepreneuring things. He's trying things out, Derek Ling. You know, he had and to change Paddy things. And up to, yeah. Yeah, up to 10. I, I think he's looking at, and again, it comes back to the best decision makers. Mm. So they're looking to play the short ball out from the back. They're looking for lads who are composed on the ball. Richard Reid has to come back into that mm. setup. I was in Croke Park before Christmas watching Richard Reid at six. His distribution in both the Leinster final and the All-Ireland Club final, exceptional. Mm. Players who are playing out of the back now have to be controlled on the ball. That's where Cork, I suppose, showed a lack of maturity the last day. 
they weren't able to find their, their forwards. I think Brian Roach gave one razor pass to Shane Kingston, which was a great score. Mm. But the quality wasn't there for Cork last Sunday and they weren't getting enough shots off. And that's the other thing. Sometimes when you're not in a game and you're struggling to get into a game, you just need to get a shot off. It doesn't have to be a score, yeah. but you have to build momentum, push up the field and Cork weren't doing that. Somebody good is not going to get out of the Munster Championship. Agree. Uh, could be Cork. Because if you're looking at it, Brian Lone is in with Clare for the last four years. He knows that Clare team inside out. Um, Waterford, to be honest, I don't think Waterford are going to be able to marry everything that they tried to do in the league and present themselves in the Munster Championship as a viable unit. So I would say it'll be one of Cork or Clare who will struggle to get out of the league with Limerick and Tip. Right. Mm. It's going to be interesting anyway. Mm. I know, happens. but you know what I want? I want Joe Canning to come back in just like Stephen Cluxton because oh. the footballers have wiped our eye and I've decided the only man to save Hurling is... Joe Canning. Right, you're calling for that now because he's doing a press call for um, the, the Sunday game so it'd be it'd need to be something very, very important to get him back. But wouldn't it be ideal? He's had, he's had a nice time, you know. He's, uh, he's been on the couch in the Sunday yeah, yeah. game. Well, he's you been know, travelling the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look... Playing a lot of golf, keeping the eye in. But wouldn't that... Let's be having you, Joe. save the hurling season if Joe was parachuted back into the Galway team for the season and... Stephen Cluxton, who are you? We we, yeah. we keep mentioning that we're going to talk about this, but we haven't talked about it that much. The next month is basically football wall to wall. The Munster Hurling Championship is going to be swamped in terms of coverage. And now I don't know about drama or importance because almost none of the football will matter really, apart from who's going to be in the Talisman Cup or who isn't, until we get to the group stages. And even then, the group stages are, you know, one of the the four teams in the groups are going to go out, and the other three are still going to be alive at the end of it. So. But it's going to be a very interesting GA season. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think the GA are missing a trick with the two under-20 games that are on tonight. I love watching the under-20s hurling. That used to be played, the under-21 hurling used to be played... In the summertime? N- well, I remember the final was played in, in September because we played as a double header with right. the under-21 hurlers to, say, 9th of September 2005. Mm. Um, and it was a great time of year for those competitions. And maybe there was a window in April where that break, like Cork aren't playing until the 30th of April there was possibly a window where the under-20s competition could have been played and highlighted and gone up against the football. Because yeah. I'd have gone and watched the hurling mm. over the football, but that's just a bias there. There you go. Sarah, good stuff. Thanks a million for that. That's Sarah, Sarah Donovan giving us her thoughts on that. We'll obviously uh, talk more about this weekend's hurling and the significance of the uh, Kildare Kerry game on the show a little bit later on in the week. But uh, some final quick comments for you. Vernie made a valid point last night. If Limerick had beaten, it has to be in the knockout stage. Otherwise, you're just rattling the lion's cage. Is that the argument that you're not going to beat them twice or nobody's going to they're not going to lose two games over the course of a season? Well we'll see Cork beat them in the first round of the league and they came out stronger and fitter and fighting so maybe he has a point mm. Yeah yeah, maybe uh, In rugby the only position we have no proven international depth is at open side well I think like I'm probably looking at Peter Romani as a potential seven he's played there played there for the Lions uh, Cluxon's the best keeper of all time you don't want to face that with the game on the line says Royal Armour also this narrative that Cluxon doesn't like attention is nonsense we are three days in and still talking about it yeah that's not he doesn't control that though Rory you know that and the other thing about um, if you're if you are uh, the best forward a generational forward and there's going to be a highlights reel of you winning a match for Kerry you absolutely want Stephen Cluxon in goals True. you've been in the back garden dreaming of like sticking a path Cluxton your entire life and here's your chance to win Lord Ireland for Kerry and it's like you can, you can do it against Cluxton or you can do it against the guy that everybody's like well, he, was, he wasn't he wasn't Cluxton's replacement he was a replacement for Cluxton's replacement who was injured that season mm-hmm. like what do you I don't I think that's that you're Rory you're, Rory, you're pointing at the difference between us and them we are mere mortals and they dream of being God <laughs> mm.